Patrick. We saw Patrick on stream before, but both these players going into this round already above the benchmark of qualifying, so they easily saw the, uh, the option to ID um, and rest one more round before going into top cut. On table two, however, Pedro also on stream managed to win this round as well, currently sitting at 33 points. That is a very convenient uh, benchmark as well, probably. 32 or 31 will be the benchmark to qualify. An opponent he beat there uh, still on 31 points despite taking the loss. So Julius in with a chance of potentially still making it despite the loss. Absolutely, absolutely. On table three, we have Christian Sanatoro from Italy against Luke Parkers from Great Britain. In that case, table number three went to Christian with a victory at 32 points. Again, like this is exactly what they need for top eight. Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with how much you're just remembering here off the top of the head. Um, very clever of you to, to go off and remember this. Let me just check the next one. Uh, Ty um, was 29 points beforehand, so was his opposition, Lucas. Uh, so that was a must-win game there for both of them. Uh, and that was a, a Lucas win, I believe, there. So coming through 32 points. Um, and so those kind of games are really important, aren't they? The ones where you're just out of range, where both of you need a result. That's where players start playing really fast, making sure they get that win, um, and fully confident in their ability with the deck to be able to play that exactly. fast. Exactly, especially going into that last run with 29 points. You knew that if you tie, neither of you two makes it into top cards. So of course, both were playing to make sure that they win because a loss, like a tie, won't get them anywhere. Yes, they get one extra point, potentially securing a spot in top 16, but you're all here to win the tournament at this point. Going with 29 points into the last run you wanted to win and Lucas was able to win there looking at table number five there was Christian Donofrio from um, Italy as well against Alexandra from Poland actually ah. um, Another Polish player looking I at think table I met, number is one. That, is that the same Alex who did the the content pieces that we've been seeing it might be um, I'll, I'll see if we can get confirmation on that because there was an Alex who we met uh, early on um, the two guys, just a little bit of uh, flavor on the, on the two Polish players we've had in the videos, if you've seen them, um, is Alex and Antek. Mm -hmm. And uh, Antek was always saying, oh, he's the better player, um, but, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't work as hard for it. You know, he, he kind of gets decks off of people and, and plays them, and, like, he's just a much better player of the game, naturally. But then Alex, the other guy, he was very, very much like, I work really hard for this. You know, I, I make sure I practice loads, and, and, and it's clearly come through for him as he's... Um, probably going to be making it into that top eight there. Yeah, well, table six had a time extension and maybe hasn't finished the game right as of now. On table seven, we had two players we talked a lot about this weekend. It was Alex Szymanski all the way from the US, actually securing a win in the last round, ending up on 32 points. And on the other side, we had Oven. We talked about him because he's globally number one in CP. Coming off from a start, a strong finish at the London Open, continuing his success throughout the regionals, was one of the first players to qualify, and actually just coming very short of qualifying for top eight at this tournament, but finishing with 29 points, very impressive. Continuing his success, probably getting another 80 points as top 16 finishers, like getting him up at 500 CP so early in the season, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, 500 CP would qualify you in, in any region, right? Absolutely. And, uh, doesn't need that much over here in, in Europe, so amazing stuff there. And I think we're really starting to see some of these names coming through as we start going down. You start to see 31 points coming from some of these players, 30 points, and that's where you start wondering, are you going to be able to sneak into that top eight? Uh, and if you are on the same amount of points as someone else who's just on the cusp there, that's when you start getting that, um, that top cut decision making which sometimes it's not always in your control it's just um, whether you uh, bubble or not based off of your opposition's win rate um, so these guys are going to be fingers crossed if they're at that bubble point um, see if they can make it into the top eight absolutely I just want to emphasize how great day two Swiss as a format is players get to play nine rounds in the first day everyone with 19 points or above advances to the next day they play another five round and while we talked about the bubble yes but with 14 rounds played there's potentially one or two players on the bubble on the 31 on the 32 points mm -hmm. it, it depends at the end of how many players participated we had like almost record-breaking numbers here in europe with over 700 almost 800 players we've yet to see how many show up in stuttgart in just over three weeks uh, over in germany but the numbers are currently like very like very successful very great to see how the game like gets even bigger and bigger grows in europe and um, it's really not nice to follow the scene yeah i mean making top 32 top 16 all those kind of high finishing positions get you loads of points like you mentioned earlier uh, gets you loads of booster packs as well so these Always guys will be happy tempest ahead of the format of course exactly with, with the new set introduced this weekend this is also what will be given out to the players as a prize so it's great to like have a little head start be like hey 
finishing top 16 maybe taking home two booster boxes one booster box and getting like an idea of the new format with the new cars pulling them as well that's always great to have and what i really like about the the day two format as well is we get to see which decks are kind of defining the meta because you can you can look at the 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 full deck list across the whole of the the tournament and once you start going down to the lower end you start considering like budget decks will come through uh ones that are easier to access and there's also going to be some that are easier to play but ultimately the decks we want to see uh, are the ones that are doing well and we've had the advantage today with day two to see two decks be 25% of the meta with uh, Giratina V-Star with the Lost Engine and that Palkia Inteleon. And that really helps us to see those two decks are probably the two best decks in format right now. And it was really interesting to see how Mew, after its success in Lille, didn't make it into that, uh, into that number. Absolutely. Like we were comparing the numbers and the decks from Lille. Um, and this weekend, and we saw the massive rise in Palkia being one of the main two decks, and Giratina, which um, I think a lot of the Lost Zone players, Lost Zone was like the big deck in Lille, um, may, might have transferred into the Giratina version for this tournament. They're already aware of the dynamics, already aware of mechanics, how to play the deck, and just adding one more attacker, one more out, basically, is, is a great like uh, flexibility of the deck. Yeah, the... the Downside of Lost Zone is it's hard to finish games because it's a lot of decisions, a lot of handling of cards throughout a game. And so being able to make those many decisions quickly across a game can be quite tricky. Uh, but we've seen a lot of the, the Palkia versus Giratina matchup. And when you go for that V star, the, the, the main attacking approach, it can be quite a quick victory. But there's always that ability to disrupt if you need to, especially if you win a game and you want to start trying some riskier plays. So um, the meta has been really interesting to see here. There's been some spice as well. We say, uh, obviously, we're at the end of the Lost Origin meta now, about to have Silver Tempest. But at this point, some people are thinking, do you know what? I've thought of a deck that might work against everyone else's decks. And we've seen the Urshifu VMAX uh, made it into the into Day 2. Uh, and some Mewtwo decks, Mewtwo V and a Mewtwo VMAX. So some interesting decks all across the board. Absolutely. And I try to remember what these players are playing. We saw Patrick Landis, uh, who tied on table one his way into top eight. He was actually playing Curum VMAX, the deck that we haven't featured too much over the course of the weekend, but which has guaranteed one spot in the final. On the other side, Pedro has been playing the Lost Zone engine, uh, also winning on table number two and making it into top cut. Just looking through the list, um, really interested to see what the final eight decks will actually be and how you want to you want a Giratina up there, don't yeah. you? You've been you've been raving about Giratina. I've been raving about this boy here, my boy Palkia. Uh, I've just started playing Palkia Intellion uh, quite a lot, uh, especially on PTCGO. Um, and it's been such a fun deck to play because it does always feel like there's ways to win it. And the advantage you've got with it, yes, there's going to be some uh, potential downsides to it next rotation. But when you've got an Intellion engine, you can just shift the numbers of your, your trainer cards to, to decide what works in the, in the current format, whether you need more disruption, whether you need to go for more damage, more bulk. And so you can start shifting those numbers based off of what's around you. Absolutely. I'm, I'm a huge fan of Giratina, and I feel like we, we have yet to find out how it places in the metagame with Lugia out uh, starting soon. Um, so I, 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 oh, it's, I that, it's that V-Guard <laughs> energy, isn't it? Everyone's thinking, well, oh, Giratina's good, but V-Guard energy is coming out, and that makes it a little bit worse. Absolutely. More, more options to consider going forward into the next format. So we already watched one final between Curem and the Giratina in the Sinos division. Um, and you talked about the time, uh, how Lost Zone might be struggling to finish games in time. Keep in mind, going to top eight, all these players will have 75 minutes. So we'll be featuring action going into the full 75 minutes, potentially finishing three games before the timer runs out. And of course, keep in mind, there are also different timer rules towards the end in single elimination brackets. Yeah, well, I'm really excited to see my first ever top eight here. And uh, I think everyone at home is really excited to see the top eight. This is where you start to see the cream of the crop, the, the best of the best, uh, the top of the charts in the, the Pokemon world looking to come out. And uh, uh, I know what's just happened. I think that's... Uh, don't worry about that. Nothing's falling apart here. We're all good. Um, we'll just have to hold this up because it might st start shaking. Uh, don't worry about us. We're going to be looking at the bracket real quick for you. And we've had a, a wonderful day uh, of, of amazing stuff uh, throughout the tournament. But this is where it really matters. You cannot lose now. Swiss is finished. We are now into that top eight. And we're looking at some of those names we were mentioning from the Swiss. Yeah, we, we, we featured Alex Schimanski in Swiss. We had Patrick Landis um, from Switzerland in Swiss. And we also featured Pedro. But it's really interesting to see that some players have have successfully managed to avoid the stream throughout the Swiss rounds yesterday and earlier today and made it all the way to top eight. So, yeah, um, on top of the bracket, we have Milos against Jory. Um, then we have Alex against Luca. 
Patrick against Alexander that we mentioned earlier. Pedro and Christian also made it into top eight. Record. So how about chat? Um, let us know who you want to see in top eight. Um, tweet at us at like hashtag regional Warschau, um, hashtag play Pokemon. Let us know. Tweet at Limitless so Connor gets that on his screen as well. We're interested to see which two players or which player you rooting for, who is your champion already and who will be crowned the Masters champion of Poland regional here in Warschau. I, I'm, I'm less focused on the players and more focused on the tools that they have within their deck. I've been a big fan of the Palkia deck, been a big fan of the Rare Candy, you're a fan of the Giratina. Uh, I just want to see the best games possible. We saw an amazing game earlier on where the actual gameplay itself was incredible and that's only going to be more so now in the top eight. So we'll see a lot more of that. Um, I'm just going to ask real quick, does our wonderful uh, Connor have the, uh, the Leal versus uh, Vorsor? Uh, matchup chart and we'll have a little look at this this was uh, the reason why I bring this up is because we were looking at this off off camera and it's an amazing representation of the difference between this regional and the previous regional uh, you mentioned some of this before but let's have a little look through this uh, in more detail so one thing that uh, sneaks out here is that uh, Giratina and the Palkia are both in number one and two in Warsaw. If you look over, you see that they have not been as popular in Lidl uh, with Lost Zone and the Cure and VMAX being the main two decks um, and then followed up with that Arceus Giratina. So I'm really interested to see that there was a tiny shift in how you play Giratina, maybe more Lost Zone versions and less of the Arceus. Yeah, and we see uh, the Regis doing quite well, Regigigas. We've seen that on stream a little bit. Uh, definitely in its best form right now. And poor Arceus is just getting less and less popular right now. Ever since it came out, it was always a threat. The ability to Starbirth has always been a threat. But uh, a few players have been able to get some success with Arceus Giratina. It just feels a little bit too slow compared to some of these decks. And, uh, and that's the real key. That's why uh, Palkia and Giratina have done so well. They're fast and they're consistent and they have multiple options. Uh, and so that really does work well against everything we're seeing on this table. Yeah, we also see how like Mew VMAX fall down. Of course, after winning that regional in Lille, everyone had it, like if not already respecting it enough, had to make sure that they had the Drapion in their list. And then again, this is this weird dynamic where you want to make sure that you have an option against that Mew VMAX, but also because it won, everyone who used to play a Mew VMAX will be like, well, at this point, there might be a lot of Drapions on the field that I want to avoid, so maybe changing to a different team. And I was just looking at that pie chart as well, looking at those little uh, slithers that were only one deck in, in day two. And interestingly, Blissey was only one in day two uh, from Lille, and that went on to the final. So there is every chance that one of those tiny little slithers you saw on the Warsaw chart might make it all the way through or, or start winning some in top eight. Just because it's less popular doesn't make it a worse deck. It just means that it's less consistent, maybe, and, and so it's not going to make those runs as often or might have some bad matchups it's had to... to move around a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. And while we wanted to bring you uh, the bracket as soon as possible, I'm also looking forward to find out which matchups are actually playing in top eight to get a better idea of maybe what is most interesting to feature and like what the, the matchup and the bracket lines up to and which deck might have the easiest or most comfortable way into that finals. So we're here in Warsaw into that top eight finally. It's been a long journey, 15 rounds of Swiss. A lot of these players playing their final option uh, of Lost Origin, their final decision to go, let's see this deck and see what it can do. And we're going to get to see a chance for these top players who've had a whole, say, three months to work out what they really want to play in this Lost Origin meta. And they're finally getting a chance to show it off. The refined lists will be seen here in the top eight. And then they'll go well and truly into the binder, unless some of the cards are in their new decks. But we'll be going in the binder as we go into Silver Tempest uh, next uh, meta. But we will take a short little break here and we'll be back in a moment where we'll get into that top eight. Um, for you and for me, we're just going to go and have a little wander, see what's going on outside, see if the, the players are, are getting ready for the, for the feature match. And then teleport back behind the desk. <laughs> <laughs> see you in a bit. <laughs>
Oh no, <laughs> we are, we're back. Uh, welcome back everyone. We've just done some Alakazam teleporting to see what's going on outside in the arena, uh, flying around. Uh, uh, we left our spoons. Um, Lost them on the way. Yeah, left them in the, the canteen. But we are here now, top eight, it's quarterfinals, and we are going to be going into a spicy, spicy first round. Absolutely. I remember earlier this morning, uh, <laughs> Connor was asking, Alex, Alex, can, can you please come over? Like, I need to know what this deck is doing. Like, why, why are these two Pokemon combined here, right? And what should we call it? What's like, the yeah, name so of this what, deck? What, <laughs> what is this deck called? And I was like, hey, let me have a look. Maybe I'll figure it out, right? And it was a Vika Vault deck. Uh, not just a Vika Vault deck. It's a Palkia deck. So there's going to be a quarterfinal match here. As we mentioned earlier when we were looking at the meta, Blissey was the one that went into the top and was able to... Uh, come second in the event despite being the only one in day two. I'm pretty sure this is the only one in day two and probably across the whole event. Maybe if there was a, a group of them testing and went for it together. But we are here in the final that is quartered, <laughs> the quarterfinal for top eight. Here we go. So we're in the top eight semi-final as well. Let's go. Uh, we're going to go into that quarterfinal right now and find out who's going to be making top four in the semi-final. We're going to go into the quarter-final right now. It's going to be for top four as we see the, the semi-final. No, the, uh, apologies here. We'll, we'll get to okay, the game in a moment. Let's, let's go back. Um, let's actually look at the pairing. Um, we haven't actually talked about the players. It is Alexander from Poland rocking that Vika Vault deck. Uh, just to give you more information, this is the Vika Vault uh, dealing 50 damage and preventing your opponent from using any items in the next turn. Which is something to think about going into Silver Tempest, it's going to be a strong deck there, and maybe by seeing it, it's going to be popular in Silver Tempest, thought, oh, I might give this a try right now, and with that weakness on Palkia, uh, and, uh, and the meta being quite heavily full of Palkia, it's definitely a good one to go for. Exactly, and that is paired up with the Palkia, Palkia V-Star uh, combination. The energy split also quite interesting. We have six water energies, uh, four speed lightning energies, and one lightning energy over there. And on the other side, um, we it look, have so it looks like uh, the the rich it's the the wrong Alex. So we were we were we were told we were getting Alex, which happened to be the Vika Vault Palkia matchup. So we we'll apologise there. It is in fact Alex Kamansky who's going to be playing Giratina V. We saw them earlier on stream already. So uh, this is going to be the Giratina mirror match: one with Arceus and one with Lost Zone. Yeah. So apologise for that confusion. I hope we get to see. Um, Vika will potentially oh, in I, that I, semi-final that was... Uh, I believe. Piece. I yeah, believe the whole way. Let's believe and talk about that in a second. But for now, Alex Shemansky rocking that Giratina V uh, Lost Zone engine against that uh, Arceus Giratina. A matchup that we have seen before and I'm really interested to see how that Pikachu plays out here. I want to, I want to believe that he started with the Pikachu and um, had, to, like, <clears throat> had to find a way around that. But looking at that first turn, actually, uh, we see Arceus in play and has a Lightning Energy attached as well, uh, which you can use for the Pikachu, but of course that uh, Arceus uses any free colors energies. So having that in turn one played down gives you the option to go for that Trinity Charge um, Trinity Nova actually in your following turn. Um, the Radiant... Um, Radiant Carnivore is actually quite interesting tech here as well because yeah. it reduces the damage by Pokemon V by 20. So especially in that Giratina Mirror, it will be quite important and it will be interesting to see if that 20 damage makes a difference. Yeah, and I, th I, th I do just want us to reset the scene here. Yes, please. We, we came into this, we were very excited for a deck that we hadn't seen before and just a little bit of a miscommunication got the wrong Alex. Very easy mistake to make. Um, I've been... Uh, I've been mispronouncing names all day long, and when they're spelt differently but sound the same, it can get tricky. But anyway, we're here, 
Alex is here. He's got an amazing deck here. Lots of interesting prize cards as well. Um, three really important options there that there's only one of in the deck. The Luminion, the Sableye, and that Snorlax. If they are searched for by Alex, they will not be possible to get out until they're out the prizes. And so this is one of those matchups we've seen a fair amount of um, throughout the Swiss. So Giratina with Lost Engine is an important card to... Um, you know, to, it's an important deck to be able to beat a lot of the meta right now, but can struggle when it comes to um, decks that are just so fast and disrupt the Lost Engine. And on the other side, the Arceus Giratina, once that Starbirth comes out, it is very consistent. It gets everything it needs to, but can sometimes lack the firepower uh, because that Arceus attack uh, of Trinity Nova struggles to hit big numbers with only hitting 180 on that double turbo energy. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think uh, Lucas, despite having the Pikachu to start, which is not optimal, he's still got his RCs out. He's still got the one energy attachment you want in turn one. So he's pretty set for that um, evolution and Starbirth next turn, potentially getting away to uh, promote it into the active position and attack, charging up a bench Giratina, which is, of course, a great way to enter this game. On the other side, um, Alex Schemanska actually playing his comfy line, um, starting to increase his lost zone count. Um, not quite sure if 7 to 2 is the exact loss on card. I see 2 on Lucas' side and 3, um, potentially even 7, I suppose, cards on uh, Alex's side. Quite heavy with that uh, potential of Colrus experiment, of course, and the flower selection getting, getting up there. Yeah, needing that 7 for the Mirage Gate, the main way of accelerating in the lost engine. And that will allow any colored um, basic energy to come out and be attached to any of your Pokemon. Um, so you see there... Grass and Psychic, key for the Giratina attack. We've spoken about the counts of energy across the day. Four Grass, four Psychic here for Alex, which allows him to not you know, prize one or discard one early or even put one in the loss zone too soon um, and can just confidently know there's four in there, can get rid of a few before needing to, to worry about that. Yeah, and uh, Alex put up an amazing board having one Giratina Vista in play, having one Giratina V with one energy attached already. So it will be really important to have multiple attackers so that once your first Pokemon gets knocked out, you still have your second benched one to come back because that will be key here. We will see the Arceus promoted, but with that Giratina Vista charged up with three energies, is that a third energy, the golden one, or is that potentially an item or a tool? We'll have to find out, but even with a third... Um, there could be a golden capture it's energy an air balloon, well. I believe that. So yeah, air balloon blinged out on the side of Alex on that Giratina on the bench. So got both the, the grass and the psychic energy, just needing a third energy. Can manually attach any of the energies in the deck to fulfill that colorless attack cost um, at the end of Giratina's attack. But Arceus there, powered up fully, and the Marnie's going to come out here uh, by Lucas. Um, so that's going to disrupt any of Alex's plans that he had in his hand. Um, and right now the Arceus will be able to attach to either the flying Pikachu or the Giratina as um, Lucas sees fit. Yeah, we saw the money in play, and on top of that, uh, Evolution Incense, getting that Beaverell out will be very great against Hand's Disruption, and uh, with five cards in your hand and the Evolution Incense played, you can even draw one card off this Beaverell here for up to five cards. Um, that will be a great way towards the end of the game, maybe with a Roxanne coming from Alex's side. But yeah, there's a first knockout, and three energies going up right onto that Giratina. Yeah, so the Trinity Nova coming through there, as you said, accelerating energy. We've got that lightning energy in the Arceus Giratina, so that allows for the Flying Pikachu to be available. Uh, Arceus and Flying Pikachu, you know, partnered up for that, uh, both the winner and the finalist at the most recent TCG Worlds. Now Giratina, a new partner into that Arceus uh, toolbox, I guess you could say, lots of different um, attack approaches that you can have. And the Pikachu, very good in the Palkia matchup, allows you to have the weakness there um, and can be used to block out basics when you're up against the likes of Regigigas. Absolutely. Not as relevant here against the Giratina Vista, but can block damage from basic Pokemon, potentially from a, a Giratina V, of course. And there's still this option for going for Thundershock and paralyzing your opponent, preventing them from attacking or manually retreating as yeah, well. Yeah, there's all sorts of little options with that Flying Pikachu to get you out of a sticky situation in a pinch. And it's also a free retreater, which is always quite nice to have in a deck. Um, so that Flying Pikachu, it's a 1-1 one, one line, but does have some utility there on the side of Lucas. Uh, but that first attack coming out from Lucas, it will only get a single prize in the, in the, in the case the Comfy was uh, removed. So uh, it will be knocked out and put in the discard pile. And I think at this stage, as we see, yeah, there's enough in the Lost Zone. So that's why that Comfy knockout wasn't too bad, because a Star Requiem coming out by Alex means that big Arceus in the active spot is knocked out, but we might see a return knockout here 
thanks to the uh, powered up Giratina that happened in the previous turn through that Trinity Nova. Absolutely. I was going to say the lost impact is not quite enough because of that raiding God of War, but having the option being up at 10. Uh, that's quite interesting in the mirror, actually, because of Arceus not having the access to that um, Star Requiem, basically, um, the, you, you, you're the only player. Having your loss on count up so early, up to 10, allows you to take that knockout, still keep your energy. However, with free energies, uh, loss impact can just come back, take the knockout here, and that's when it's crucial that you have a second attacker ready to go. Yeah, one of the great things about Arceus Giratina is you've got access to that uh, Radiant Guard of War for the 20 damage reduction from Pokemon Vs. You also normally have a big charm in there, so you can start making yourself bulkier. Because you know you can't get those one-hit knockouts with the Arceus, you have to start thinking about surviving more turns. So uh, the big charm plus uh, Guard of War combination is great for that, um, and the Star Requiem is a way to get over it, but only once per game. So you're uh, going to have to find a new way around that um, bulkiness that Lucas can put forward. Alex will have to think about maybe uh, targeting some of those bench Pokemon. Absolutely. So there, there's the threat of lost impact here. We'll have to discard two energies, though. So he has to find a way to keep his energies alive, have enough energies in play. Uh, he doesn't have that merge gate to accelerate more energies. And his RC is already down, so he doesn't have the option to just um, discard the double turbo energy either. So it will be two energies. Um, um, from either his active or one of the bench Pokemon, and it, it will be tricky to keep attacking with a lost impact. Indeed, and we see that Marnie again for disruption. Uh, I believe uh, Joe Bernard, who was on stream before, he was playing a very similar deck to this, and he tweeted out saying, I managed to path Marnie myself to day two. So path plus Marnie is a wonderful combination that can disrupt people. Um, not as relevant in this matchup because there's not a huge amount um, you need to worry about pathing, but you know the threat of Luminion, uh, maybe a Radiant Greninja might get used to try and draw, so it can make things more awkward out of the Marnie. Um, so the, the Giratina here, getting that knockout and then getting that vital big charm out of the prizes. Yeah, I like the dynamic of this. Uh Giratina face off here. One, we already see the Star Requiem, but on the other side, um, we, we, like Alex is not playing that Radiant um, God of War himself, so he, he struggles to deny the KOs. So Lucas was quite comfortable promoting his Giratina Vista, using the Lost Impact, taking the knockout, because he knew without a choice belt, um, like Alex won't be able to KO in return. And of course, he doesn't, he doesn't have access to the list, so he's not quite sure if there potentially is a um, choice belt or not here to increase the numbers and take the knockout or potentially play the path of the peak if that is in there to negate the ability of rule box Pokemon such as that Radiant God of War. And that's it and, and the path in this situation could negatively impact Lucas. Uh, an interesting combination where you've got such an important ability on your Arceus V-Star yet you're willing to put that path on the list and, and sprinkle it in at the right times to um, force your opponents out to find new options. As you mentioned, right now, that Radiant Gardevoir is important enough that they, they want to keep the path out of play so that it still remains active and keeps that Giratina V-Star in the active spot too big for a uh, lost impact. And that's where you start looking at the Luminion, the Giratina V, and the Flying Pikachu V on the bench and start wondering, where's the access to boss here for Alex? Absolutely, and as we're heading towards the end of game one, we actually see how players making sure that they're aware of all the discard, like all the cards in the discard part of the opponent, making sure going through the possible lines of your opponent, especially with each flower selection, you want to make sure that the cards that are crucial towards your end game are actually still in your deck or in your hand, so you don't want to discard anything. But seeing that potentially like two monies have already been played, less likely to get hand disrupted, you want to keep some cards in your hand. An interesting uh, support to include for Lucas. We have seen one of them played, and you can actually see one in the Lost Zone there. Uh, the Chorus Experiment. We're starting to see used in some non-Lost Zone engine decks because it's such a good uh, draw engine to see five cards and just put two in the Lost Zone. Access to five cards through draw is amazing. You know, we've seen cards such as Marnie get used, and you're disrupting yourself down to five cards, but it's often enough to get through. Imagine adding five cards into your hand of your choice and then going, oh, I don't need these two. They go to the Lost Zone. So Chorus Experiment has started being used just as a draw supporter uh, on the side of Lucas here. But now that Luminion in the active spot. and uh, Seems like it took a shred to take 160 damage there. Um, interesting. Is that to potentially oh, finish that up with a Sableye afterwards. Um, that's one option. We talked about how the Lucas... Zigzagoon Ping could be an option as well with yeah. the, the Headbutt Tantrum. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. With a Luminion at 170 HP, it is just 10 
HP short of being knocked out. Another dynamic that we haven't touched early on in this game is how Lucas uh, technically doesn't have access to Star Rekim early on, but you just mentioned he's playing three copies of Colorless Experiment. If he somehow buys one or two turns where he can Abyss Seek to increase his loss on count even further, he might crunch up the numbers up to 10, which won't be easy, but gives you one more chance. However, you have to ask yourself, is it worth setting up Star Requiem when he can also just attack twice? Yeah, maybe that Luminion play was uh, to avoid the Roxanne, because uh, once you get down below three prizes, you can get Roxanne. Uh, we know here that that's not a problem, Roxanne not appearing in in the list of Lucas, but that is something that a lot of people have had to play through and around all weekend because Roxanne has brought back games which seemed unwinnable just through a Roxanne disrupting the hand down to those two cards uh, being enough of a threat. So if you get that damage and finish it off later, next turn can go for the double knockout and potentially win the game that way. Absolutely. One play to play. One way to play around the Roxanne is uh, with that setup of KO. Um, you can actually take multiple prize cards and then win the game before going down to like below three. Yeah, so very by smart. taking by taking the ping and taking two knockouts and then potentially taking out another V Pokemon, you're not in danger of getting a Rook Sand. So very smart um, adaptation there. Very smart way to play. We see a double turbo energy hitting the Luminion. I think one way to play around, of course, is that Aqua Return that we already saw twice on stream. Yeah, that's a potential uh, Aqua Return being um, needing a Water double colorless. The only downside to that, the Water Double Colorless, is that uh, for a Mirage Gate engine, you can power it up in one turn. The only way Lucas could power it up in one turn is um, if he had Water Energy in his deck, which he doesn't have available because he plays uh, Radiant Greninja as opposed to, uh, to Radiant uh, Gardevoir as opposed to Radiant Greninja, which means that he's not going to have Water Energies there. So that uh, Luminion uh, did get knocked out there by the, the Headbutt Tantrum. This is the kind of player we like to see on stream. Alex showing exactly what top players are capable of, the, the kind of decision-making they do to avoid potential outs, uh, put themselves in the strongest position. As we said, playing around Roxanne uh, has been something that not enough players have thought about uh, and have been caught off guard when they're one or two prizes away from victory, not got a great board state, Roxanne plus a knockout, and they, they get out of the game. Yeah, so the, the missing pieces to victory here would be a gust of one of the Pokemon V, um, especially the Giratina V on the bench, and then finding the Giratina V star to evolve. And also by having a, a non-attacking V in the active spot, they had to find a way to retreat it. And, and that's, that's another factor that a lot of people have to consider is when you put something in the active spot and it's, it has to be retreated, it's another, another thing the opponent has to think about. So that Luminium play was genius from Alex. And I'm, <laughs> I don't know if I can, uh, can overstate enough how smart that kind of play is. I think a lot of people at home will think of that and go, oh, I might bring that into my game, start putting stuff into the active, leaving it for the headbutt tantrum in the future or even like a... Uh, and Teleon quick shooting ping, or if you've got a Sableye, using that sprinkling of damage is such a good way to guarantee good board state for the future. Yeah, and um, yeah, Luca's Luke actually in a quite precarious situation here, but use that uh, Charon's Care to remove a colorless Pokemon with damage also helps him to retreat it um, and get promote basically the Greatina V Star now, which is facing the Cramorant. Unfortunately, uh, Lucas has to take three more prize cards by attacking here and discarding the double turbo energy. He is at two prize cards remaining. However, if Alex Chomansky finds a way to access the Giratina Vista and has a gust, doesn't even need the gust, I suppose, but uh, would need to find a way to shut off that um, Radiant God of War to, eb to be able to take the knockout. Yeah, we've seen a lot of Sharon's care over, over the weekend. A great include in any deck which has big normal type attackers like Arceus, like the Hisuian Zorork. Uh, it ha helps in those uh, low prize matchups, you know, the Regigigas um, and with the Lost Box, because you, you take those hits, you need to recover it. Sharon's Care does so, um, so it helps you win you back turns. But in this case, being used on the Barrel is basically a switch out, remove that 110 damage from the game. But as we mentioned, that big charm plus the uh, Radiant Gardevoir makes this Giratina V star very bulky, but there is a Giratina V there that wasn't evolved and is vulnerable. Um, so right now, this looks like the, the route Alex is going to be trying to take here. Ordinary Rod, bringing Edgies back into the play. There's only two energy on that Giratina, so he has another Mirage Gate after the Ordinary Rod, and Alex is going to take the game. And what a route to victory there, having to get that bench Pokemon up uh, to move around the big charm and the Radiant Gardevoir. Uh, Alex with the clutch plays, smart, intelligent plays to win back the board state at the end. Yeah, I really like how Lucas was like, hold on, hold on. You only have two energies attached. Please <laughs> make sure you have enough energies to attack. And Alex was like, 
Don't worry, I got this. Here's the Mirage Gate. Attach two energies from my deck that are just putting back with the Ordinary Arc, and we're all set to clutch out the first game. It can be so easy in those moments when you know you've got game in hand, you know you've got to do it, and you don't do the actions quite right, and you just want to prove to your opponent you've got game in hand so you can move on, get onto the next game. But sometimes you haven't revealed everything, and in that case, the Mirage Gate was, was hiding the there in the hand. The but yeah, Alex, that Luminium play, the 160 damage on the Luminium, left it in the active, finished it off with the Headbutt Tantrum later, that was so smart because it not only saved him from a potential rock sand that he might not have known was in, uh, not in the opponent's list, but it also meant that the Luminion remained in the active and was not in a comfortable position uh, as far as board state goes. Yeah, but like, even if he retweeted that Luminion in the back, the ping would have gotten it anyway. So it was really great. Either you keep it active um, and the opponent attacks and next knocks it out, or if it goes back to the bench, you can still ping it and take out the remaining 10 HP there. We see players actually setting up the prizes. It seems like they both found their basic Pokemon to start the next game. I like how the, the sleeves are matched up here. It's orange against... <laughs> see, I, I personally don't like that because I don't know who's Dex who. <laughs> But <laughs> I think there's slightly different tones of... There's like one's a brown. Yes. And then one of them is sort of like a, a, a brownie pink. Yeah. Looking at the start, actually, <laughs> and at the prizes here, we see the Zigzagoon oh, as, as a start, which is I not quite amazing. Up. And there's the Giratina with a single attachment, the Path to the Peak, and a pass. So let's see. There's a Luminion, uh, which will be neglected through that Path to the Peak, of course. Um, let's see how what else he can get out of the Colrus um, to start off with this first turn in game two. I like how you quickly moved on from my sidetrack, but it is important that we take a moment to look at the active Pokemon. We see, firstly, a Zigzagoon in the active spot. Never something you want to start with. Uh, Battle VIP pass will help in that situation, but still, uh, a Pokemon you don't really want on the field unless you've put it into play for the reasons we saw in the last game. Uh, but then, as far as prize cards go, again, on the, um, the Giratina V side, some of the important cards like Greninja, like the Snorlax, uh, in those prizes. Otherwise, nothing too crazy. Cramorant, there's two of those in the deck. But as you keep uh, gesturing to me, <laughs> that opposite side, three Mani uh, will be taken probably first because generally these players will be taken from that bottom up. And so those Marnies will be available later on. But that is three of the four Mani in Lucas's deck in the Ab prizes. Absolutely. We saw how big of a role they played in the first game. Like, Lucas was back-to-back -back playing the Marnie, not only getting a fresh hand himself, but, but was disrupting the Colrus and um, flower selection, um, increasing the, the hand count of cards. So not having that av available, um, leaving uh, Alex to his full potential with his full hand makes it quite hard to actually uh, disrupt and make sure that he doesn't get the full setup. So yeah, he started with the Zigzagoon, was able to actually um, retreat it, has starts with the flower selection, the first one, and even in the first turn, like thanks to the Colrus and the flower selection, he's already at Lost Zone count three. I think I've decided on the color name for Lucas's sleeves. I think Salmon sums it up nicely. <laughs> so we'll see how this turn goes here for Alex. We saw the VIP pass getting out all the useful bits. We see the flower selecting confet is there and are easily available to use and a quick and easy flower selecting there for Alex as he's going to go into his next confet to do flower selecting. Top two cards there we see. Ooh, Another a scoop of net. Quick decision here. Going for the psychic. I think confident that the four count of psychic in his deck might be worth it, but um, still not quite sure. Oh, last minute switch scoop up net. Interesting, like he has one psychic energy in hand. He decided, it's quite interesting, he could have used the scoop up net to, uh, to retreat uh, the comfy as well. However, he has chosen to use the psychic energy, attach and manually retreat, so the psychic energy ends up in the discard pile. You can see a psychic energy in his hand as well, and maybe he hasn't had a chance to really check those energy. He did with the battle VIP pass at the start, but maybe not quite clocking how many psychic energy were there. Uh, so one in the discard pile now, one in the hand, uh, and really not wanting to put too many in the loss zone, uh, especially with uh, the attack cost of Lost Mine might come into relevance. So Psychic Energy definitely more important than the Grass Energy to keep in deck, uh, but ultimately the four count should keep him pretty safe from, uh, from going all out with those Psychics when removing them from play. Absolutely. I suppose the, the his plan was to... Um promote the Cramorant eventually and attack with that. And through um, attaching the energy and retreating, he still had the energy in his discard pile, gets access to that through the ordinary rod later on in the game, which is better than having a scoop up net in the discard pile, which he won't use anymore. Yeah, while we were watching Alex's turn there, Lucas uh, just getting a turn attachment onto the Arceus on the bench, the lightning energy there you see. 110 damage remaining on that Giratina from the Innocent Spit of Cramorant. 
Um, and there was an abyss seeking done by Giratina. As you can see, two in the lost zone, two cards there. It looks like two Arceus. Yeah, the Arceus, uh, the option there going into the lost zone. So abyss seeking, kind of like a chorus experiment, allows you to dig a bit deeper, uh, but definitely not the option you want to be taking uh, most of the time, especially down a game. Yeah, uh, we see another 110 damage. Spit innocently, not as innocent as you would think. <laughs> <laughs> Which t double hitting, uh, taking out the Giratina V and taking the first two prize cards here in top eight. Yes, and the Cramorant has done a few of those double spits where it's taken out a V Pokemon because uh, that 110 damage works perfectly with the 220 hit point Pokemon Vs. Uh, just two in a row, uh, announcing those attacks back to back. A very good way to get rid of Vs early on whilst you're building up that loss zone. And of course, we see the ability that we have talked over and over again. Starbuff getting any two cards out of your deck. It is a double tube of energy, allowing him to use Trinity Nova. On top of that, he also has the Mani, the one last remaining Mani in his deck, um, to further, like, to start disrupting Alex's beautiful, like, big hand, of course. He needs to start finding another attacker to build up on after using that Trinity Nova. Needs somewhere to put those energies. And he's going to be looking across, seeing that Giratina V-Star on Alex's side, powered up and ready to do the damage. And it may only needs to do a lost impact, because last time the only reason lost impact wasn't effective was because of the Radiant Gardevoir and the Big Charm, whereas right now neither of those are in play. Uh, so uh, Lucas definitely on the back foot here, and he's going to be looking to prioritize the Radiant Gardevoir longevity more important right now than the ability to knock out. Yeah, keep in mind like um, the Radiant God of War also protects the Arceus, so you don't want to leave that open for an easy knockout either, but Ooh. it looks like he prioritizes drawing more cards. He's just not quite happy with the setup yet. Yes, he has the Arceus, but he doesn't have any Giratina on the bench yet. It's interesting that he didn't pick up a Giratina that he could charge up, but instead wanted three more cards. Um, let's see if he, there's another quick ball. Uh, he, that, that way he gets access to his Giratina and can start setting that up. Yeah, using the quick ball to discard the Arceus V-Star there. Uh, probably won't be looking to get another one of those out. Really needs access to those Giratina and does get one on the bench there. If he can fill out this bench here, then he'll be able to use the Collapse Stadium maybe to get rid of the Crobat, which he's benched. And no one really wants to have Crobat down in a matchup where they might need to just boss uh, boss's orders something on the bench for game. So a lot to think about here, a lot to come back from for Lucas. Uh, but still, that longevity through the Radiant Gardevoir is going to be key to survive in the active spot and force that boss's orders out of his opponent. Yeah, and we see how Lucas responds. Uh, Trivity Nova here getting free energies on the Giratina. Looks like only picking two. Um, making sure that he still has some in his deck, I suppose, for the following turns. Um, and just has like two attackers lined up here. Let's see if Alex finds an answer to that. He has his Giratina Vista, but he has to respect that Radiant God of War reducing the damage. We talked about this. He has no um, choice spell in his deck list. Um, so that makes it quite hard to pick up the Chaos. However, he actually decides to boss up that Giratina yeah, V on the bench. Go. Yeah, that's what we expected to see. And I think that's part of the reason why Lucas didn't fully attach, because in his head he knew there's a good chance it might get knocked out. But even then, if it does get knocked out, he's going to be so far behind, because all it will be on Alex's side he'll need is two uh, prizes, and that will be the Crobat, right? So he, at this stage, Lucas can't start building up any uh, Vs without the threat of a boss's orders. Um, there is only two boss's orders in Alex's list. So stuff might become um, safe on the bench uh, if we see those boss orders come out, but that's why he only needs to. He normally doesn't need to worry about bossing too often. Yeah, and Alex must be feeling great here. He took the first game in a commanding position. He's now leading, only needs two more prize cards to take. Uh, his Giratina in the active spot is not there. And we and see it. the fist bump. Lucas deciding that there's no way I can come back into this game. Very commanding victory here, coming over all the way from the US, rocking in top eight, now advancing to the first semi-finalist. Wow, Alex playing so, so well there. Really strong performance. And just never, well, in the first game, looked to be a bit behind, but that smart play with getting the Luminion into the active, hitting it with the Shred for 160, leaving it on 10 hit points, and then using the Headbutt Tantrum from the Zigzagoon to finish it off. Uh, that's the sign of a veteran right there. They know what they're doing in those <coughs> big moments. And fair play uh, on the other side. Lucas making it to top eight is still an amazing achievement here at Warsaw and go away with lots of points. Absolute, absolute commiseration to Lucas here for coming in close, finishing top eight, great finish. Um, 
I think we have we have yet to see how other players are finishing up, uh, especially following the Polish players maybe at the local I event. See, I think we saw two in top eight at least. Yeah, Alex seeing. with the Vika Volt Palkia. We, want, we all want to know what's going on there. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, and Alex, we will be following Alex throughout the rest of the tournament. He's now in semifinals. Uh, we have to see how the other top eight games played out and then potentially see him play again or back in finals, which will feature for sure. Yeah, well... Fair play, Alex. Uh, you've got a very good deck there. The most popular deck in the, in the tournament. Well, joint most popular with 25%. And also one of the most successful decks in this Lost Origin format. So a smart pick there from uh, Alex. And then uh, on the other side, Lucas going for a less common pick, but one that is still very consistent across a long day of Swiss. One thing I want to point out is how interesting it was how the season started. Actually, one of our European players flying all, uh, all over the pond to NA to win a regional there, Todd Reckliff, of course. Now, Alex Chemenska, maybe he's on a revenge course. Maybe he's coming over to Europe and be like, hey, you stole one of our regionals. I'm here to steal yours in Europe. I mean, that would be a story <laughs> right there, the, the American coming over to steal points. And, and to be fair, he is looking very good. Like, that was a clinical performance right there, one of the quickest games we've seen on the feature table. And it was just due to that clinical execution, a quite a fast matchup with both decks looking for the big hits, um, but just seemed to have really good control over the decisions. We also saw him taking time over some decisions, which I think is something a lot of players will appreciate. The fast movement of cards, when you need to make a, a, fast, a slower decision, taking that time, balancing up your options, and then and making that informed decision. Absolutely, and I'm just seeing him coming over backstage to us, so we'll be back with a little interview talking to Alex Schumanske, advancing to top four, so stay tuned to hear his thoughts. Welcome back. Uh, I'm here with the winner, Alex. How are you feeling? Uh, pretty good. Yeah, I mean, that was the quarterfinals. That was probably one of our quickest matches we've had on the feature table. Mm. Uh, did that go as you were expecting? Is that matchup tend to be favored for you? Uh, that matchup is not great. I didn't expect to win that fast, like that easily. I mean, game two was just bad, but game one I actually expected to lose. I don't know how I pulled that one out. Yeah, that Luminion play where you got it up to the active and shredded it and then mm -hmm. dealt with it with the head drop chantrum from the Zigzagoon later. Uh, what made you think to do that play there? Uh, I assume most Garatina Arceus lists only play two switching cards, and he burnt both of them on his first turn. So I was just like, okay, I mean, I'll go for this play. I don't have another win con. I'll go for it. And you gave it a go, and it worked. So uh, that's the kind of decision making that comes with being a more experienced player. You start to know lists before you've even seen them. You know, we're very fortunate here when we're talking about the game. We can see all the lists there. Um, and so you knew that there was multiple things you were covering with that just based off of your knowledge of the list. So amazing stuff there. Um, what kind of decks have you been coming up against a lot here in, in the Swiss? Uh, I hit five Kiram and then basically just a bunch of Arceus and then Garatinas. And you found them found them all right? Yeah, I mean, Kiram's a good matchup. Arceus is fine. Garatina Mirror is a mirror match. Yeah, we've, we've seen a few of the Kiram matchup. Uh, the Roxanne is, is so good in that matchup, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, the Roxanne has been the MVP on stage so far, and, and the Lost Zone Giratina, one of the most popular decks here, 25% uh, of players have been using it. Wow. When you came into this, did you expect it to be one of the most popular? Uh, I expected it to be most popular. I only played it because it's one of two decks I brought to Poland, so uh -huh. I just it was a choice. Yeah, and, and, and you say brought to Poland. You've come all the way over from America, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, any reason why you felt like you wanted to come over to this event? Was it just good timing? Are you, uh, you trying to get as many points as possible? Good timing, and this is very good for me for the Brazil stipend, and uh, Australia stipend, I guess, but yeah. for Brazil. Yeah, you're going to be going into to Brazil with lots of practice, and you <laughs> come up against all the European guys, and that'll be with Silver Tempest. Is there any decks in Silver Tempest that you're 
excited about? I don't, I don't want you to reveal any secrets, <laughs> but anything you're no. looking to, to play, maybe? Nothing special. Just Lugia seems very good. I'll probably end up playing that unless something else presents itself. Yeah, well, uh, I'm sure we'll look forward to seeing you again in the future, maybe in, in the final. I don't know if we'll get to see your semi-final. Probably not. Um, but you've definitely made your trip over here worth <laughs> it by yeah. getting all this way. So uh, thank you very much, Alex, for coming on and having a chat. Uh, is there anyone you want to shout out at home or thank? Uh, shout out to my sponsor, the Shuffle Squad. They've actually done a lot for me recently. and just They're probably the best sponsor in the game. Um, just go check out them and all their sponsors. And then shout out to my mom and brother for getting me here. Uh, I am not great at travel, but they are. Well, that's amazing. We, we always love to hear the support, not just from uh, your peers in, in Pokemon, but from family and everything. Um, so, well, congratulations again. Um, take a little break now. You, you've earned it by winning that game so far. So we'll see you back in a bit in the semi-final. Um, but for now, we'll go to a quick little break and we'll have some more Pokemon trading card game stuff for you later on.